Well, yeah, actually, uh, I was born in 1961, and I'll be 50 next week. Oh, so that was thanks. It's pretty amazing because I really thought I wouldn't live to be 50. I really thought I would only live to be 30 because I was doing so many crazy things as a young girl that uh, the fact that I've lived to be 50 is pretty incredible. And and uh, along the way, of course, you know, I not only did I inflict all kinds of suffering on myself, but I also got pancreatic cancer and and beat that too. So to be alive and and 50 is pretty incredible. I lied about my age for years. That's why. There's all kinds of conflicting uh, information on the web about when I was actually born. But I was born in 1961, November 13th, which is just a few days away. So I'm pretty happy to be alive. Well, and, looking forward to but yeah, I was born in Ventura in 1961. My mom uh, was just 18 years old, and she met my dad there. She was a high school student, and he was quite a little bit older. He, he uh, was an embezzler and was in prison when I was born. And so my mom ended up moving to Los Angeles uh, to get away from him and his family. He was in jail, of course, in Chino State Prison, but he did get out and live with her again for a short time, but it didn't work out, and he went to prison again. He's, he was a career uh, criminal, pretty much, until he became a Jehovah's Witness uh, many years later. But uh, So I was raised by my single mom, and uh, eventually uh, we moved to... Um, at the Atwater area of Los Angeles on Ripple Street. We lived right by the LA River uh, in uh, what's uh, really Glendale Boulevard and Riverside Drive, that kind of Silver Lake, Atwater uh, area. Um, and my mom met my stepdad who was an artist. He went to Otis Parsons, then it was called Chenard uh, Art Institute. And he was an artist and I really loved him. I was only uh, four when they met and he was the first guy I ever saw play music just for pleasure. He played flute, he played guitar, and um, he would sing in a real shy, quiet voice. He, he was never a professional musician, but he sang songs. Uh, and, and I remember the, the, the first song I remember ever hearing him sing was St. James Infirmary, which was ironic because St. James Infirmary, of course, is about the hospital in London where prostitutes were sent uh, to die. Uh, many of them had, uh, you know, STDs and, uh, or they were sent uh, to the mental part of uh, St. James, the St. James Infirmary. So um, my dad was also a very, my, my stepdad was a really colorful character. In addition to being a musician for fun, he was an artist and he illustrated Bible coloring books and he worked as a layout artist for adult film uh, magazines. So I learned at an early age that religion and music were acceptable ways to make money and that was a theme and has been a theme throughout my life that uh, sort of gospel of sexuality uh, has has uh, woven itself throughout every song and every record that I've ever written or, or, or uh, performed. Um, as a little girl my, my mom my mom had a really rough childhood. Her mother was a mental patient and she was uh, uh, in a wheelchair her whole life and my grandfather was an alcoholic and my uncle was a schizophrenic. So my mom at seven or eight years old was taking care of these three broken adults in her life. Her mother bound to a wheelchair and mentally ill, her father the alcoholic and her brother the schizophrenic. She learned really young to take care of everyone around her and so by seven or eight she was cooking and cleaning and when I came along my mom handed those same things to me. So by the time I was seven or eight, I knew how to cook and clean and, and do a lot of things that most kids don't learn how to do until they're older. My mom also inherited a lot of really bad habits like uh, verbal abuse and uh, my mom verbally abused me from an early age. Uh, I was, you know, uh, called a cocksucker long before I ever knew what that was and what you were supposed to do with it. And it wasn't until years later that I uh, learned that those kinds of words weren't used in every family. I believed that they were used in every family. Certainly they were used freely in my family. And uh, my mom also taught me to shoplift when I was nine or ten and if I stole good stuff for her she'd be really nice to me. I was well developed at an early age so I could wear the same size clothes as my mom and she put them on under my, she taught me how to put them on under my clothes and sneak right out of the Sears store or the JC Penney unnoticed. At the same time my mom was teaching me to shoplift, she put me in charm school. And uh, so I could steal a set of flatware and I knew which one was the salad fork and which one was the dinner fork, which came in handy much later <laughs> in my life. But it was a very confusing 
thing because you're, you're being told that it's okay to steal, but you need to be charming and polite about it uh, at the same time. It's an interesting dichotomy. Um, and uh, I, I, my, my first, uh, besides the, the exposure I, I had to music with my dad's live performances, uh, he never performed in front of anyone. In fact, he was so shy, he would let me sit in the room as long as I was completely quiet. If I made any noise, he would kick me out of the room and close the door and just practice his music on his own. Uh, but I learned to sit there very quietly in color and listen to him because I loved the sound of his voice and the sound of him playing his, you know, uh, 38 Gibson guitar that he would uh, play on. And I had a record player in my closet in my room. It was just a little tiny record player. It only played 45s. But luckily my parents had a big stack of 45s. And so uh, that was my first exposure to Elvis and Frank Sinatra and Bobby Darin and Connie Stevens. and. Uh, I spent a lot of time listening to those records real loud to drown out the fighting upstairs with my parents. There was a, it was quite a turbulent household. We used to call it the house of hysteria uh, on our block. And, uh, and so it was a great escape to have those records. And I, I also had this uh, aunt who was a hardcore alcoholic and she uh, was a singer and sang a lot of Irish ballads like Danny Boy and she loved Ray Price. And when she was really drunk, she would play over and over again Ray Price songs for the good times and you done me wrong and she would sing along to them and her voice was terrible I think it was ruined by too much cigarette smoke and too many bad men and too much whiskey or something but she couldn't sing and so as a little girl I used to sit in the corner and watch her get drunker and drunker and listen to these songs over and over and I thought I can sing better than this lady and that's how I started uh, realizing that I could sing because I would sing along to the records and be able to hit every note and I could sing much better than she did and I learned those Irish songs uh, with a lot of enthusiasm and those were the first songs that I learned all the way through besides the ones that I'd listened to on the little 45 so uh, you, you found uh, that you had a perfect ear you could hear and, and duplicate and that's a very rare talent yeah and it was it really came in handy once I started school um, I, I used uh, I, I sang uh, in the choir, and it, even though my, my home life was broken, the teachers at school really liked me. I was very bright, I was in the gifted program at school, and it, my elementary school years were really successful. Uh, there was a choir there, and the, and the teacher who ran the choir loved my voice, and I could sing soprano, I could sing alto, she would move me to different sections. And then I started, my very first band was called the Gemini Three, I'm not a Gemini. My two cousins were. So, so uh, your your first band. What kind of band was that? Was well, it a school band? It was no. We started a band. We thought it was a band. It was called the Bo It was uh, called called the Gemini Three, but it was a Bobby Darin tribute band, and we only did Bobby Darin songs. We did Beyond the Sea. We did Mac the Knife. We were unaware that other singers had also recorded those songs. We just thought they were Bobby Darin songs. So we. We didn't call it a Bobby Darin tribute band, but essentially that's what it was. We did all the songs from a couple of the albums that my mom had that were Bobby Darin records. We did Splish Splash um, and, uh, and a couple of those other songs. We wore little red suits and we had dance moves that we did. And, and uh, we were inspired by the Temptations, I think. My two uh, cousins were uh, half black and half white, and they were very good uh, dancers and singers. And so the three of us would harmonize and sing these songs. And uh, somehow I got the, my teacher, the choir teacher at school to let us have a school assembly in sixth grade. So the whole school got invited after school to see our show with my little band, the Gemini Three. And that really was a, a huge uh, catalyst for what was to come because that applause and that recognition I got, I went instantly from being the geeky, nerdy kid uh, who sang any, any chance I got to, to being accepted and, and to getting a lot of uh, uh, respect from my peers. It didn't last long. The next year was seventh grade and I got sent to a junior high that was quite rough. Eventually I was expelled for fighting at that school. It was um, one of those situations where I would get beat up by Mexican kids and uh, it didn't matter who started the fight. You were kicked out and sent to other schools. So I I ended up being sent to the, the roughest junior high in my area in East LA, which was uh, uh, Irving. There were three junior highs, Irving, Nightingale, and Luther Burbank in Los Angeles, which in Northeast Los Angeles. And I was sent to Irving, which was uh, in Cypress Park. It was a really rough school. And when I went to that school, I, uh, I became kind of a, a chola. 
I plucked my eyebrows out. I stole a bunch of gangster style clothes because I had been getting beaten up habitually by gangsters at the other school. I decided to become a gangster at my next school. And, and it was, uh, in those days, the, the, uh, the, the vatos, you know, the gangster guys at school had ghetto blasters and they would bring them to school and listen to oldies with their ghetto blasters on the, on the, uh, the football field. Um, it was long before, you know, uh, people had iPods or anything like that. It, they just had this little ghetto blaster, battery operated. And so I started learning a lot of oldies uh, from, the, uh, from the vatos at my junior high. Oldies by the Midnighters and uh, um, uh, Billy Stewart and um, uh, really uh, wonderful old, uh, you know, the Delphonics and the Stylistics and, and those oldies. Rosie and the Originals, you know, Angel Baby, songs like that. And I, I learned those songs note for note. And so pretty soon, not only was I accepted, but I would walk by and the, the, the cholos would go, hey, singer, come here, sing us a song, man. And so I could sing every oldie that they put. I could sing Earth Angel by the Penguins or, or Rosie and the Originals or any, any uh, oldie that they gave me, I knew how to sing. And uh, so singing really became a part of my, uh, my life. I sang in, at the ninth grade graduation, and uh, I, uh, I sang throughout my school career. Eventually, I lost interest in school. Even though I was pretty bright, uh, no, one in my, no one at home cared that I was failing everything. No one really uh, kept track of what I was doing. So school became for me a social event where I could go and sing and get attention. And singing was that way all the time. My mom would take me to the library and rather than be in the library, I'd sit on the library steps and sing to every stranger that walked up those stairs. And I got a lot of positive affirmation and a positive attention from that. You know, uh, the little old man in the cardigan telling me, what a nice voice you have. Or the, you know, lady with her three kids stopping to listen to me sing rather than go into the library. It really... Uh, boosted my self-esteem and and then I I, be, I started going to the Mormon church there were three Mormon families on my block and so to escape the craziness of my household to escape the shoplifting verbal abuse uh, nightmare that was my home life I started going to the Mormon church and the Mormon church was one of the first places besides the sixth grade assembly where I got a chance to perform live and I became the primary uh, children children's choir director I didn't know anything about music, but I liked little kids, and I was a good artist, so I made uh, big poster boards with all the lyrics to the songs on them and, and taught these little kids how to sing uh, religious songs. And that was a real uh, gratifying experience. I found out that I could lead a group of kids, and, and being the choir director for a short time was really uh, very exciting. But it was hard to balance those two things of my double life. Uh, at school, I had I was the singer, uh, vato, rough girl, sniffing glue, and hanging out with gangsters. Then I'd go to church and teach the children's choir, and then at home I was shop shoplifting with my mom and 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 being called, you know. Uh, so so would you would you call this like crazy making is what they call it now? Yeah, for sure. And 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 there weren't. Uh, there wasn't anyone, it was really strange how my worlds were colliding because I noticed with my Mormon friends and their families that nobody ever got called filthy names at the table and the Easter ham never went flying out the window and everything was really calm and sedate and, and, uh, and wholesome. And then at my house, the turbulence and the fighting and the flying cutlery and, and plates and the stealing and the verbal abuse was the norm. Uh, at the house of hysteria and then at, at at junior high the kids i was hanging out with were you know all gangsters sniffing glue jumping the girls they didn't like you know smoking cigarettes uh you know staying out late and and then going to confession on sunday it was a very strange uh, mixture of of all these different kinds of worlds intersecting but the common theme for me was singing i, I sang at home to escape the the chaos, I sang at church to teach the little kids how to sing and in the church talent shows, I sang at school for self-esteem and, and uh, for, um, for acceptance by my peers. And so singing really was the common thread that was keeping everything together. By the time I was 17, I had had a baby and... Uh, now, tell me, how did, was, that, uh, was that a reaction to, uh, because it sounds like you were very rebellious of, of your environment. You were kind of rebelling against school because like, you know, even though you had a high aptitude, 
you're you're not performing because you're making a conscious decision of rebellion. I mean, would you? I I, I just there wasn't anyone in my corner saying if you do well in school, you can go to college and you can go somewhere else. There wasn't anyone. I didn't understand that doing well in school meant some sort of emancipation. I didn't. I didn't. No one ever told me that. No one. No one in my life ever said you're smart and you can you can achieve and if you do well you you could go to college for free somewhere in a different state or you could go to New York or to Hawaii or or to a different place no one ever told me that so my reality was that my home life sucked that there was so much verbal abuse and and damage happening at home that the 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 wholesomeness in the Mormon church was almost surreal I finally got kicked out of the Mormon church when I was 16 for, for fornicating, something I still do today. Um, and uh, it was, uh, the, the, there, was the, there were such extreme extremes in each world. The, the, the gang world was so extreme. My home life was so extremely damaged. And the church was so extremely surreal and wholesome and Disney-esque that none of those worlds even seemed real. But the common theme was that I could sing. I ended up getting pregnant young because I saw all of my friends doing it. And all of my friends, many of my friends, got pregnant at 17, I mean 16, and suddenly were getting a welfare check, living in their own apartments, having boyfriends with low riders and driving around. And I saw getting pregnant as a way to emancipate myself from my situation. I didn't, like I said, there wasn't anyone saying, you're capable and articulate and smart and you could go to college so I thought my only escape was to get pregnant get married have a boyfriend with a low rider and get a welfare check and that that would be the way that I could escape my turbulent household um, of course once I had a child it complicated my life uh, in ways that I couldn't have imagined and then I had to figure out how to uh, support myself and this young child I had so then survival became the the real uh, issue and uh, to survive, I put a lot of my musical aspirations on the back burner. I had dreams that I could be a famous singer, and uh, sometimes I used to take the bus to Hollywood where they would film Welcome Back, Cotter, and Happy Days, and, I would, and Carol Burnett show, and I found out what, on a church outing that you could sit in the audience of these shows for free, and that often there was a stand-up comedian or someone who warmed up the crowd before the actual filming and they would ask questions in the crowd or ask people if they had a talent to share. So I found out that I could sing at these TV show tapings if the, if the uh, comedian uh, asked me what my talent was. So I'd sit as close as I could to the place where I thought that they'd notice me and wear bright colors and be bubbly and they would inevitably say, well, who's got a special talent? And I'd raise my hand and I'd get to sing. I sang at the, you know, for, at all three of those shows. I sang in the, before they, uh, you know, would do the filming and was getting applause and recognition from the people in the audience from my singing. Um, eventually, though, uh, I had to put those kind of aspirations on hold because I, I had a child and I had to support my child. And so I became a, 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 a phone sex girl. And I, I saw an ad in the LA Weekly that said, make $500 a week from your own home, must be attractive. So I, I didn't know if I was attractive, but I knew that I had big breasts. And so I called the number and I went on a, uh, an interview and I got a job at this phone sex company. And through the phone sex company, I met Annie Sprinkle and Candy Samples and a lot of uh, uh, prominent sex workers of that day. And uh, through phone sex, I uh, ended up becoming a topless model and was on the cover of a lot of magazines like uh, Gent and Jugs and Hustler and High Society, Velvet Talks, magazines like this. And I got a column. By virtue of posing nude, I became a sex expert and they gave me a column called Candy's Corner. At the same time that I was starting to make money as a model and starting to make more money than I could on welfare, uh, I moved to Venice Beach and found some musicians who were playing on the boardwalk and uh, they were there was a guy playing string bass and a girl playing rhythm guitar with their bucket trying to make money but neither one of them could sing very well so I walked up and said I can sing and I think we can make more money if you guys let me sing with you 
And so they said, okay. So I started singing with them uh, country songs, uh, uh, Cold, Cold Heart, Love Sick Blues, all Hank Williams stuff. I had discovered Hank Williams because of Linda Ronstadt. Linda Ronstadt recorded several Hank songs. Uh, I Can't Help It If I'm Still In Love With You, um, Love Sick Blues. Uh, and so I, I would read who was writing the songs and then I'd go to the library and check out records of Hank Williams. And the first time I heard Hank Williams really was a, a a pinnacle point in my life. I, so you, you heard a Hank Williams song and then went to the, the library? Is that what? Um, I heard her sing, Linda Ronstadt sing okay. a Hank Williams song, and I read who wrote the songs, and so then I went to the library and found Hank Williams. Okay. And because of Linda Ronstadt. She was huge at that time, and her songs were being played on the radio constantly. 75? Yeah, 73? probably, yeah, 73, 74. And so, uh, so I found Hank Williams because of Linda, and then because of Linda. I, uh, because of Hank, I found Anita Carter, and I found the Carter family, and I and I found Roy Acuff and um, uh, Ernest Tubb, and so I really started listening to a lot of deep early country: Kitty Wells, uh, uh, George Jones, uh, just uh, Webb Pierce, er early early country, and that's what I really liked. I, I, that's that music spoke to me. I had a good voice for it. I could yodel. I learned, you know, I could I could sing high. I could sing low. I could uh, really be melodic and country. So these people on the boardwalk, um, once I went up and started singing with them, we did start making money. People would come by and put money in our bucket, and by the end of the day, we'd have like you know seventy five dollars to split between the three of us. That was a lot of money for us, and I could make that money in 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 an hour or or in two hours, and it was a lot more than I was making doing phone sex or on my welfare check or anything else. So I started a band with them called Haywire, and that was my very first band that I that I I had. Uh, besides the little dabble in it what, in elementary that the, school. What, what they're calling country punk? You were Not yet. It wasn't country punk yet, but, well, it was country. It was solid country. Um, but it was punk in the sense that we would play punk rock bars with other bands who were punk rockers. So, And it was punk rock in the sense that we weren't playing music because we wanted to get famous. We were playing music because we wanted to make enough money for beer and we wanted to have a good time and because we enjoyed what we were doing. And, and, and at this time, it was like the early, by that time it was, you know, 1979, 1980, 1981. Um, all of my worlds were intersecting the same way they always had. I mean, now I was making music uh, with these two people I had met, Damon and Lissa Kay, and uh, in, in my little band Haywire. I was working as a phone sex worker and a sex model. And, and I was playing suddenly in bars like the Crush Club uh, on Cahuenga in Hollywood or the Cafe de Grand, which was a punk rock club, or the Mask. Um, we'd play these punk rock clubs and we'd play on bills with the Circle Jerks and Black Flag and Top Jimmy and the Rhythm Pigs and Los Lobos and Dwight Yoakam and the Blasters. And I was punk in the sense that I was a porn star singing hillbilly music in punk rock bars. And I wasn't doing it to, to further my own career. I was doing it because it was fun and because I could get free beer or because it was fun and I could be around all of my friends. Everyone at that time in the Los Angeles music scene was part of it together. We were all anarchists doing it our own way and that's what made it punk. It wasn't so much the quality of the music as it was the defiance of, of authority or the rejection of the big record business conglomerate. Here was Linda Ronstadt in her camp making million dollar records and doing, you know, taking a year to make records and doing mountains of cocaine while they were making the records in the top notch studios in Los Angeles. And then there was this other counterculture scene of, you know, the Circle Jerks and Los Lobos and Dwight Yoakam and, and, and the Blasters playing music because, that they loved, not because they wanted to be famous, but just because they could. And, and so that, by virtue, we were all in it together at that time. It didn't matter what kind of music you played. It didn't matter um, whether it was, you know, jump blues like Top Jimmy and the Rhythm Pigs, or whether it was rockabilly rock and roll like the Blasters, or whether it was Norteño East LA music like Los Lobos, or whether it was hillbilly music like me and Dwight Yoakam and Rosie Flores. It didn't matter what, what kind of music it was. It mattered where we were doing it and that we were doing it our, our own way. And, and that's what made it punk. Eventually I did 
uh, put a band together called the Armadillo Stampede. And in the Armadillo Stampede, Will Ray was my guitar player who had a unique string bending technique and was a sort of a speed metal guitar player. And so that lent a sort of country punk flavor to my music. It became electrified. In the beginning, it was just all acoustic, string bass, rhythm guitar, and me singing for many long years. I played the lone hand, you know, just hillbilly stuff. But then when Will Ray joined the band and uh, we became an electric band, it became more of a country punk thing. It's still rockabilly, hillbilly, country, and punk, all of it intersected in, in the venues, in the style of music that we did, and in our attitude, which was we can do whatever we want and we don't care. Pretty soon, the big record companies started finding out about this little scene, and that's how uh, the Blasters and Los Lobos ended up signing to Slash, which was just an independent, Slash was just an independent label, but eventually Slash was bought out by Warner Brothers. So there were bigger things ahead that nobody really thought about at the time, but before Slash, everyone was just doing it for beer and to have a good time, and those were my early exposures to, to, to musicians.